everyone for joining us today. Really hope you enjoy this, uh, this, this virtual presentation. We'll also tell you a little bit about how we got to the careers we currently have, because I know that's always a popular question. Um, so I'm gonna really quickly share the presentation um, to get us kicked off. My name is Agata, as Wendy mentioned. All right, so you should be able to see that. Um, so as Wendy mentioned, uh, the, the, the mission at YWeb is to really expose you to a lot of great content um, that hopefully helps. Wendy, do you mind just muting yourself? Um, that helps you really have the courage to take on great careers in STEM. And we really strive to connect you with great experts in the fields and to show you how we got there so that you know you definitely know that you can do it too. And of course, since in-person events are delayed for a while, we made the Young Women in Bio available online. Um, and you're able to check out and join a lot of events um, such as this one with the Young Women in Bio organization. And YWIB is part of the Women in Bio organization, which is a um, volunteer nonprofit organization. So you're able to stick with Young Women in Bio and then grow into being a Women in Bio. Um, so you're able to kind of do the whole lifetime of being with, uh, within, the, within the Women in Bio fold. So, um, and Women in Bio supports women nationally. We have 13 chapters, including some in Canada. And we also partner with many different organizations, hospitals, um, universities, and other companies, such as the one I work for, which I'll tell you in a moment, um, to host many different events and have many different volunteers. So the content, the programming content is very, really varied. So there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, going on all the time. Those are the 13 chapters that I mentioned. And uh, these are some of our national sponsors, including the company I work for, Alexandria Launch Labs. And uh, you can use this link to check out some of the virtual events occurring. So Young Women in Bio online. Now let's uh, jump right into the presentation today. So um, I'll introduce myself. I'll be the co-moderator for today's discussion. My name is Agata, and I came to America actually when I was 13. Um, my mom and I moved here. We immigrated from Lithuania, which is a really small country in Eastern Europe. And when it was time to go to school, I went to college in upstate New York in Buffalo. And I knew I always liked science. I really liked biology. So I figured, well, let me st study something in the scientific field. Let me do a PharmD. So I studied um, some farm, farm, uh, farm, doctor pharmacology classes. Sorry, my dogs are snoring. Um, and I l really learned really quickly that Chemistry was really hard for me and biology was much easier. So I ended up switching my major to biotechnology. Um, so that gives you an opportunity to work in a lab and become a researcher and also uh, the opportunity to continue with, um, with graduate degrees. So I studied biotechnology and then uh, worked in a lab while in Buffalo and also in New York when I was home for, uh, for the summer. So I volunteered part-time at a lab. And I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. So after I graduated college, I moved back home to New Jersey and was looking everywhere for my first job. It was really hard, I won't lie. I didn't have any contacts or internships in the New Jersey area because everything I did was in Buffalo, New York. So that was really tough. So I looked everywhere, Monster, LinkedIn, and I actually found my first position through Craigslist, which uh, maybe you guys don't even use Craigslist anymore, but um, that's how I found my first uh, big lady job. And um, I joined a startup company in New York City, worked there um, as a science liaison, which means I just looked at data. We didn't have any actual labs in the New York City location. We outsourced all of our laboratory stuff to CROs, which are vendors that do the research for you. And we just looked at data. My, uh, the company founder noticed that I really liked speaking to people more than I like looking at data. So he uh, gave me an opportunity to learn a little bit about investor relations, which is basically representing the company to a bunch of external folks uh, from investors to uh, key opinion leaders, to um, folks in the clinical trials. 
So that was what I started doing at the pharmaceutical company. Um, so the rise and fall, we raised money, we failed clinical trials, I had to look for another job. And then I joined Alexandria Launch Labs four years ago. Um, so just celebrated my fourth year anniversary here at Launch Labs. Um, I'll tell you about Launch Labs in just a moment. And um, what I do at Launch Labs is I was able to combine my passion for people and science and uh, create really great events for our startup entrepreneurs. So Launch Labs is a startup platform. We have half office and half lab locations in a few different places in the US. Um, and Alexandria is a really big uh, real estate company that provides life science companies with space such as lab and office. And I work for a really small part of that, which is Launch Labs, which is providing space to startups. So let's say you graduate college, you have a really great idea and you have some money, you want to get your science off the ground, you can join a company like Launch Labs and really work your science and get to the next inflection point within, within your company. So that's what I do at Launch Labs. And we also have a laboratory, as I mentioned. So um, Juan Ru is our laboratory director. So Juan Ru, can you tell us a little about yourself and how you got to the position that you currently have? Sure. So nice to meet everybody today. Um, I'm actually in Launch Labs Pasadena. So I know all of you are on the East Coast, but I'm here in California. And I've been working in a lab since I was 16 years old. Now, back then, back when I was 16, they allowed people like me to work in organic chemistry lab, which is kind of dangerous. But regardless, I really enjoyed it. And I've worked in laboratories, in biological laboratories, vi virological laboratories since I was 16. And then just a few years ago, I decided to trans transition over to laboratory management or laboratory director, which is sort of providing everything that's needed for the scientists. So safety, equipment, um, anything having to do with the building. Um, as, as Alexandria, we own the building and also just supporting the scientists with the research they're doing. So still um, in the science field, but just not so hands-on, um, not so much pipetting. Uh, but today I get to play a little bit with the equipment because this site is actually closed. So I will show you as much as I can. I've turned on as much equipment as I can so that um, you ladies can actually see how it might work. But you also see, unfortunately, a lot of things are um, completely turned off and there are no live scientists here to show you what they're doing. I wish there were, I wish there was some, like a zoo where we could like watch them working. I love doing that. But uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have that. But I think we'll still have a great time doing experiments together. Thanks so much, Wanru. So we'll take a really quick tour through the lab. And then Wanru will lead us through an experiment. And you will determine who the guilty one is. So yeah. we, do, we do have some scientists right now. Look at that. We have about 30 girls or 20, 20 girls here. So we do, we do have a full lab. That's true, that's true. All right, so I'm gonna switch my camera so that um, it's facing towards the back. As you can see, I'm actually sitting in the lab right now. And um, by the way, if you want to, as I'm going through the space, you can type questions into the chat box and Agata will actually read them to me because I can't see the chat box on my iPad um, and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, so this is one of our small laboratory spaces. It's very typical, it has a bench on this side, it has some equipment on this side. And behind me, you might have seen, this is something called a fume hood. It's not currently operational, but it's where we would store acids and flammables. And you can actually raise that sash, put your hands inside and work in a ventilated space. So I'll throw that to you right now. So I'm gonna open this up. Unfortunately, it's off, but you would conduct your experiment here and the air would be pulled from the lab space up high, high into the atmosphere where the fumes will not hurt anybody or you will not be breathe, breathe those fumes. All right, so let's continue on. Oh, this is a very important part of laboratory safety, which is an emergency eye wash and shower. So if I pulled that handle down, that shower head would start pouring water and a eye piece would come out so that you could flush your eyes if, gosh, God forbid, <laughs> you were actually exposed to chemicals. But that's also another very important safety element of the laboratory. So let's continue through. This is a hallway and this is the offices where 
different scientists were to analyze their data. And something you might have noticed is I'm not wearing a lab coat or goggles. That's probably the most essential part of our personal protective equipment, our PPE. But unfortunately, because again, the lab is quite closed down, I could not even find a pair of goggles to wear today or a lab coat. So part of me, that's not good laboratory practice, but something to keep in mind. So now we're gonna enter, some, enter into a place called a tissue culture room. And what you'll see is that outside of every door, we have these signs which list the hazards. So it doesn't mean that all of these things will be in this room. It's just giving you an idea of what you may be exposed to. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's dangerous. It's just informing the person entering the space that these are potential hazards. Okay, so you'll see it says biosafety level two, hepatitis B vaccination re recommended. And this sign is just indicating that we might be working with human cells or human products in this room. Okay. So this is a room that probably most people will have not seen because it's one of the cleanest spaces in the lab. It's called the tissue culture room. And what we're doing in here is we're growing cells, all kinds of cells, sometimes human cells, sometimes animal cells. And the scientists will actually sit at something called a biosafety cabinet. So I'm gonna show you one right here. And the biosafety cabinet serves two purposes. It actually, keeps the scientists clean. So I'm gonna turn on the light so you can see the inside here. So this is the sash. Okay. And I'm turning it on. So what the scientists will do is they will take their samples and they'll place them on that work surface there. And it has two purposes. Number one, it prevents whatever's in the sample from coming on us as the person that's working. But also we, as people, we breathe, um, we have bacteria and viruses that are just part of our body, dirt that comes from our clothing. And so this also blows clean HEPA filtered air onto the samples. So I'll try to show you, it's not real easy to see, but you can see that the Kim wipe actually gets stuck on the vent. Can you guys see that okay? okay? So what it's doing is it's drawing the air down, cleaning it, and blowing it back onto our sample. So sterile air is always constantly being circulated in here. It protects us, it protects our samples, and it allows us to grow our cells. So the cells, fortunately, I don't have a sample. They will be in little dishes or flasks. And so this is where um, they will be fed, they will be split where they grow more and more cells. And then once they're done, the scientists will actually put it into something called an incubator, which looks like this. So incubator is just a warmed chamber. And as you can see, to keep it warm, they have this glass door so they can look inside to see their sample without actually letting the heat out. Then inside, there are all these shelves where they can place round dishes or flasks of cells. Now, cells like a warm environment, they like a humid environment, and they like an environment with more CO2, more carbon dioxide than the ambient air, so the air in the room. So what we do is we'll put a pan of water on the bottom to keep it nice and humid. We pipe CO2 gas in a line into the back, and of course, we heat it to 37 degrees which maybe Agata can help me do the conversion. I think it's around 95 or 98 degrees. It's pretty, it's pretty warm actually. So we keep it nice and warm in there. Okay. So that is our tissue culture room. Some little accessories is a microscope. I'll show you a better example of the microscope. This is a little one, a water bath to warm the media, which is what we feed ourselves. And this is something called a centrifuge. Okay, let me pop it open for you. So what it is, is basically a big spinning machine. So let me pop that lid open. You'll see inside there are all these buckets and we will put our test tubes here. And once the machine is closed, it'll actually spin at very, very high speed. And once it spins, it's going to make all the heavy items in the test tube go down to the bottom. 
It's a very simple way to separate the cells from the liquid. Okay, now again, I'm not wearing a lab coat here, but it's really important that everything in here be sterile. So we have lots of alcohol for cleaning, lots of bleach for cleaning the surfaces. And of course, I would be wearing a lab coat as well to try to keep everything clean. All right, we're gonna continue on our tour. Any questions about the tissue culture room before we leave? Okay, fantastic. In the corner here, you might see lots of red trash cans. So anytime when you work with human samples, animal samples, or what we call medical waste, they have to be disposed of in a proper way. And so these, you might've seen the sign plenty of times, but you'll see that biohazard sign. It doesn't mean that there's anything harmful in there. It just means there's a potential. So this waste will be treated in a special way. It'll be autoclaved, which is like a form of sterilization and then dumped into a normal um, landfill. Okay, so this is our shared cold storage area. So in the lab, we provide, at Launch Labs, we provide lots of shared equipment. And this is an essential part of the equipment, cold storage. And, you know, it's just like your fridge at home. It's just like your freezer except it's much bigger and we provide many different temperatures. So I'm so sorry, these are not turned on, but this entire freezer is minus 20. So that's kind of like the top part of your freezer. So this whole thing could be filled with test samples. And then because biological samples are sensitive, this is a minus 80 degree freezer. When you actually take a sample out of here, you have to wear special gloves because the boxes are so cold sometimes, they can hurt your fingers. So you can see there's an interior chamber. Let me open this up for you. And these are the boxes, let me angle it up, see? Of course I can do it because it's turned off, but we would store, store all of our samples in here. So minus 80, again, because different biological samples require different, um, temperatures for to which to keep them stable. And then this here is an autoclave. Um, what would it, we would do is anytime we wanna sterilize anything or decontaminate anything, we would put our samples in here. The tray comes out, we load our samples in here and using steam and extreme heat, it would kill any microorganisms that are growing on the material. So even if you put a glass in there, even though the glass is, looks clean, there are bacteria and viruses on the surfaces. So this is a way to decontaminate, sterilize everything. So it's fun, so funny because we have a machine here which is really, really hot, that's our autoclave, really, really cold, our cold storage. And then we also have an ice machine like you might see at a restaurant. Again, it's open, it's, it's empty, but I'll open it for you. So this is where we would have all of our ice. and. Scientists would take some ice, scoop it into one of these purple buckets here, and, they'd keep, and then they would actually put their test tubes in here and keep that nice and cold so they can work at the bench. So again, temperatures are really important to maintain in, the, in any experiment. And you might have seen a centrifuge, that centrifuge, this is an example of a huge centrifuge and it spins much, much faster and much larger volumes than the centrifuge that I showed you in the tissue culture room. All right. And now oh, the ultimate in cold storage is something called a liquid nitrogen cryo freezer. So it's not hooked up, but normally it would be hooked up here to a large tank of liquid nitrogen, which would be pumped in to this interior chamber. So we talked about a minus 20 degrees Celsius freezer, a minus 80 degrees freezer, Celsius freezer, a cryo freezer, a liquid nitrogen freezer, I think can maintain a like minus 176 to minus 400 degrees Celsius. Maybe Agatha could do a little search for me. Um, so the temperatures here are extremely, extremely cold. And you can actually put cells in here for years and they will still stay, stay viable. 
meaning if you take it out, it will actually, you can thaw it and grow those cells again. So somewhat, that's why the liquid nitrogen tank is so important. All right, so I'll show you how we would normally get our samples. So we would put on this, this face shield and these gloves. Let me just check real quick. Can you hear me okay, still Agata? Perfect. Okay, great, all right. So imagine, okay, just use your imagination girls. All of this um, liquid nitrogen, it would look like gas coming out, like cold gas, like a fog. And then we would pull out from each, it's so hard, give me one second here. Okay, don't, don't do this at home, okay? You should use the cryo gloves. Okay. okay. So as you can see, all the boxes, the same sample boxes that you saw over there would be stored in this stack. And in this way, we can preserve hundreds and hundreds of samples in this space. So I'm actually gonna show you, oopsie, we lost one, we lost one. Let me show you the inter interior chamber. I'll show you what it looks like right now. Okay. So let me move this over so you guys can see the interior chamber. So you can see how many stacks we have in there. All right, continuing on. And um, unfortunately it is not on, but this would be something called a walk-in cold room, which is basically like a walk-in refrigerator. So this whole room with all those shelves would be filled with media, reagents that the scientists need to use, and sometimes boxes um, of reagents as well. Okay. And something that is on that I can show you is our incubator shaker. So you've seen all kinds of different temperature regulated environments. I showed you the incubator in the tissue culture room. I showed you the cold room, which keeps everything at two to eight degrees Celsius. Um, this incubator shaker is a piece of equipment that's used often for growing bacteria. So bacteria like it nice and warm, they like at 37 degrees Celsius, and they need to have constant movement so that the bacteria don't settle to the bottom. So I'll show you what it looks like when we open it. So you can see, and I, I know you can't tell, but it's nice and warm in here, it's toasty. And these flasks just slip into these folders like this. And normally the bacteria would be in the solution. And so by shaking it, it makes sure that the bacteria all get aerated and have plenty of room to grow. And scientists sometimes put smaller amounts in test tubes like this, so they can grow small amounts of bacteria or they could be uh, some experiments require different temperatures. So this provides shaking and incubation. When you close it, it will start again. Okay. I think it's, it's ramping up slowly. Okay. So here the display, you'll see that it's kept at 37 degrees and then the, and the speed is slowly ramping up. Okay, that ends. Um, our tour of the lab and the shared equipment and common spaces. We're gonna go back to the main lab to um, start our experiment. Any questions about anything that you've seen here? Cold storage, cold room? Yeah, one roof. So you said it's a BSL-2. What hmm. about the COVID virus? Uh, what about the scientists that work on the COVID virus? What kind of BSL would they need? Oh, that's a great I've got a question about it. Thanks for reminding me. So. Laboratories are 
classified into different biosafety levels. So even if you enter a laboratory like the one we're gonna go into now, just because you're handling certain chemicals and microbiological organisms, it's already considered a biosafety level one laboratory. So for example, this bent, this lab here, which has let me take this a little bit, which has a lot of uh, open benches and where scientists would work on the bench, this would be called a biosafety level one laboratory. But the tissue culture room, so these are now organisms that are potentially effect infectious, like COVID would be one. Um, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, HBV, uh, HCV, so any sort of virus, that would actually be considered a biosafety level two. So that's when they need to use the biosafety cabinet, the, the, the um, equipment that I showed you that had a stash to you put your hands inside. And so uh, that's how they determine what safety equipment is, is needed by how dangerous the pathogen that you're working with. So whatever sample you're working with will determine what safety measures you need to take. And it will also determine what biosafety level the laboratory will be designated. Does that help answer that question? Absolutely. Okay, great. All right, so in this space, again, there's no biosafety cabinet. We're out in the open. This would be, you would have to wear gloves and lab coat and goggles. I'll show you some of the equipment we typically use a lot of people like this one. It's very simple. It's just, I put some dye in here to show you guys. And there's actually a magnet in there. Is that a white thing? And in the base is a magnet as well. So when I turn it on, it spins the solution. And it's great because you don't have to mix it. You can add more reagents to this. We'll call it a buffer or we can call it a solution. It's just a mixture of you know different chemicals. And it, it actually mixes it for you. And when we're making our solutions or we're making our buffers, we oftentimes have to measure things out very precisely. So this is the scale. And it's a very, very pre precise scale. I'll show you. That is actually, I'm going to set it clear to zero. This can measure this little piece of plastic tray is 2.36 grams. So that's exactly how accurate it is. It can measure tiny, tiny amounts of any reagent. So for example, I'll measure some agarose for you and I'll show you how precise this instrument is. Okay, I used to be really good at this. Let me see if I can get one on the dot, okay? I'm, I'm terrible, I'm so off. I'm so off. I used to be able to get one gram of agarose on the dot. Okay, not bad, not bad. And again, you can see there's hardly any, hardly any um, reagent in there, but that's how precise our scales are. Okay. Now moving on, I'm going to show you something called a thermal cycler. If we have time, we'll go into it. But this is actually um, an instrument that's required for PCR or polymerase chain reaction. What it does, it amplifies DNA. Um, targeting specific sequences. So it can amplify DNA exponentially. And I'll open it up for you to see what it looks like inside. Like a lot of things in science, <laughs> we try to use the smallest volume possible because the materials needed for the test are very expensive. So here you can see how small these test tubes are. And each one of these would be, would hold one sample. So I can open it up for you. So we would put our DNA of interest in here, our PCR primers, and some other reagents. And this machine, all it does is it would it heats and cools at precise times. And I'm going to close the lid. Even the lid is heated. So if anybody's and, ever gotten a, P, a COVID test, is this the machine that they use, Wanru? Maybe not this exact one, because they probably would be even on an even smaller scale, like a teeny tiny scale. Um, volumes would be even smaller, but very, very similar. The principle is the same. And to be honest, it may look exactly like this or smaller. Okay. And then continuing on, we just have one more piece of equipment I'd like to show you, which is our microscope. 
and we can get into more detail about the PCR once we get to that section. Okay, so, so when you guys think about microscopes, you probably envision um, like a scientist looking into a machine that has two optic optical, um, but two like binocular type parts like to look into. But now microscopes are so advanced that they actually have large display screens like this. So I'll let you guys choose. Would you like to see um, a small intestine part, an artery, or a pancreas? Put it in the chat and then I'll put it on the screen for you. What are the options again? They are small intestine, artery, a piece of an artery, so that's like the veins in your heart or a pancreas. <laughs> all right, we're, we're two for two. Oh, okay, we're getting all of them. <laughs> I think artery's winning right now. Okay, artery it is. Small intestine's winning. <laughs> it's <laughs> okay. a competition. We might have to take a look at all three. Okay, all right, sounds good. I'll have them ready while it's warming up. Okay, so here we go. So it's hard to tell, but inside there are three objectives. That's just basically three magnifications. So let's start with the small intestine because that seemed to be popular. Okay, I'm gonna click on something called RGB trans. It's basically the light, the wavelength. And so the microscope is so advanced, it's actually focusing for me. I'm gonna move this, this is called a stage. I'm gonna move the stage so that we can center our piece of small intestine. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start from the lowest magnification. So you can see this is like a section of the small intestine. And let me focus in for you. And by the way, this piece of small intestine is stained. That's why it looks violet. It's, it doesn't normally look like this. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit better so you guys can see. Okay, let's go to the next magnification. Okay, so now we're actually be able to see the individual cell shapes. And what's very interesting about the small intestine, as you can see, as it goes out towards the center. So this is kind of would be the inside of the intestine where the food is passing through, the shape of the cells actually change. And then let me do the highest magnification where now you can see the individual nuclei, that's all those dark dots um, within there. That'll be very, very important. We'll go back to the nuclei later. Okay. And to show you um, some of the more powerful um, techniques that this microscope can do. I'm going to show you an example of fluorescence microscopy. So I don't, there's not a slide. This is a, a, a picture of a slide. But what this is, is it's a cell that's been staying with three different dyes. So the blue is tar targeting the nucleus. That's where all the DNA is. The green is targeting the, fi the fibrins. So these are all the supportive protein structures in the cell. It gives the cell its shape. And the red is targeting the organelles. You might've heard of these terms in your biology class. Those are the little organs in the body of the cell. And so these are three different color channels and they can combine the three different color channels to produce an image of the cell. I'm trying to get, a, get rid of the glare a little bit. So you can see the blue of the nucleus, the green of the fibrin structures, and the red of the organelles. You can even see here, this cell is about to split into two. So using microscopy and staining, which is also a very important part of micros microscopy, and different color labeling, scientists can collect all sorts of different um, information about how their cells are growing and how they're reacting to different, for example, drugs that they're applying to it. Okay, all right, so we're going to um, stop the microscope demo now and return to the DNA experiment. How are we doing on time, Agata? Uh, I think we're doing all right. 
Okay. All right, so again, this is not all the equipment that a lab may have. And honestly, every lab will have different needs, but we at Launch Labs, we really try to provide what is commonly used. So this is what typically will be used in a laboratory. Any questions on what you've seen so far? Can you get certain colors to target certain parts of the cell? Certain coloring to, get to, to target certain parts of the cell? Yes, absolutely. So um, scientists use many, they're called fluorophores or chromophores. So there are just chemicals that when they shine a line on it, light on it, will produce different colors. So what they usually will do is they'll select a chromophore, like a green color or a red color, and then they attach, for example, an antibody or basically a protein that's targeting what they want to study. So when they attach the color to their antibody, they apply that to the cell, it'll stick to whatever they're interested in. And so when they put the cell on the microscope and they shine the light, if it's work, if their experiment works, it should light up just like the lady saw there. And again, they can use multiple colors, just the one color. Good question though. Thanks, Bonru. Okay. All right, so if Agata would be so kind to share um, the slide deck. Coming up. Um, for any of you long, young ladies, um, I know it's it's uh, COVID, so maybe people haven't been returning to school, returning to lab, but um, have any of the long, young ladies here had an opportunity to intern in a lab yet or work in a laboratory setting? Does any, yeah, does any equipment look familiar to what you have at school, maybe? Okay, gotcha. I'm looking forward to it. All right, sounds good. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so today we're going to focus our experiment on DNA. So you might have heard this term a lot, either in the science classes or maybe on TV. It's, it's a very powerful way and um, to analyze uh, basically human gene expression or to analyze, um, yeah, basically just between two individual people. You might have heard DNA mentioned in 23andMe, which is a DNA typing test or like a dog DNA typing test. You might've heard that. Uh, DNA is also how we identify COVID. Uh, so when you get a nasal swab, they're going to use a DNA amplification technique to identify COVID sequences. And um, I'll dive into all of that today, but let's just get to the fundamentals. First of all, what is DNA, right? So it's a sugar molecule, a very, very long one, and it's called deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's located in the nucleus of the cell. So you can see in the picture, there's a nucleus and the DNA strand is stretched out. It's very, very small, but it's very long. So in one cell nucleus, there's six feet of DNA, even though the width of the DNA is only two to three nanometers. So it's microscopic, not even visible with a microscope, but it's so incredibly long. And the way it's packaged in the cell is it's actually wrapped around those little round balls. Do you see those little round balls there? And those DNA structures form what's called a chromosome. So it gets wound up, wound up into an X. So that's a chromosome. Every human cell contains a certain number of chromosomes. Do any of you know how many chromosomes a typical human cell will contain in the nucleus? Oh, wow. Wow. So impressive. Wow. Yes, answer right away. That's correct. 46. That is correct. And every species is different. So birds have like 42 or whatever. Every species is different. Now, of the 46 chromosomes, where does a person, an individual like you, where did they come from? Where did these chromosomes originally come from? Yes, exactly, exactly. So 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad, or you know, 23 from the egg and 23 from the sperm. So even though it's, it's crazy because uh, a sperm I think is like 
hundred times smaller than an egg or something like that. It's so much smaller. It contains the same amount of DNA. Okay. Now, DNA is, I shouldn't say it's only no located in the nucleus. It's also located in one other place in the cell. Does anybody know where DNA, where else DNA is located in the cell? I'll give you a hint. It's, an, it's in an organelle. Oh my gosh, you guys are so I'm so impressed. Yes, it's located in the mitochondria, which is in the body, in the cytoplasm of the cell. And since you guys are doing so good, where do you get your mitochondria from? Yes, correct. Only the mother, your mitochondria are 100% from your mother. That's because as we discussed, the sperm is very small. It doesn't have any cytoplasm. The egg contains all the cytoplasm and in the cytoplasm is the mitochondria. So it's actually a very powerful way to trace your ancestry through your mother back in time because the mitochondrial DNA doesn't really change much because it's passed from mother to child, from the mother to child over and over again. Whereas your chromosomes can change quite a bit, right? Because they're a mixture of the, the sperm and the egg. Okay, we, amazing, you guys are doing great. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna use um, a technique today called RFLP, which is very long, but it stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. So as we mentioned, we all have 46 chromosomes. And actually the truth is our DNA is not much different. So 99.9% .9 of our DNA is the same. So you, me, Agata, everybody on this call, 99.9% .9 of our DNA is the same. And you know, between us and chimps, it's like 99%. So it's really not that much different actually. So what we're gonna analyze today is, is that small 0.1% difference in our genetic sequence. And I'm so sorry, um, if you can go back, I, I, I skipped out on one thing, which is that our DNA is made up of four base pairs. So C, G, T, A, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and adenine. So these four nucleotides spell, form the alphabet of our DNA sequence. It's only gonna be these four ever. And so the variances in our base pairs is what we're actually going to try to figure out or what we're gonna to use today. Sorry, so go back to me. go forward again. Thank you. Okay. And then, okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, you would take a sample like a cell, like from a blood sample or from a swab from the inside of your cheek or do you have cheek cells? Then you would use a detergent to break it open. So everything inside the cell is gonna come out. And then, we would use, we're gonna use something called a restriction enzyme, which I'll get into more detail in the next slide, to chop up that DNA. And then we would run it on agarose gel to visualize and separate the DNA. So, okay, thank you. You can go on to the next slide. Okay, so you might've heard me mention restriction enzyme or DNA digest. So what these are, are these are a category of enzymes, which are proteins which recognize certain genetic sequences and chop them up. They actually cut them. And this is actually a very, very important part of the way some organisms like bacteria, that's really how their, gen how their genetic um, sequences and stuff are get modified over time, okay? So I've listed four different uh, restriction enzymes. And as you can see, they identify different base pairs. So for example, HAE33, three identifies GGCC. And if wherever it sees those four base pairs, it'll cut it right in the middle and split that DNA in half. So we can exploit this or use this attribute of these restriction enzymes to start differentiating people's different DNA. So in the example on the left, you see suspect one DNA only has one of this type of sequence, but suspect two has two of these types of of, um, of, of sequences. Okay, this is a great question. So someone asked, is DNA digestion the same as splicing? It's actually the first step, step in splicing. So what would happen is um, you see maybe the third um, DNA down, there's a little cut there. So it's a sticky end, it's really small. So you can see sticky ends. Yep. So 
that would be where the DNA is opened up or cut in half. And then you can actually place another piece of DNA cut with the same restriction enzyme and you can actually glue them together in a procedure called splicing. So yeah, actually, thank you so much for that question. It's an example of um, genetic recombination or you can say splicing. Okay, um, so returning to our example here, for suspect one, if we were to cut that DNA with one restriction enzyme, how many pieces would we get from that reaction? You can put it in the chat box for suspect one's DNA. So we made one cut there and that piece of DNA, how many pieces would we have left after the reaction is over? Yes, correct. Everyone got it right. Yes, two. Okay, perfect. Okay, now for suspect two, which is on the right, you see there's two cuts there. So if we were to cut that piece of DNA in two places, how many pieces of DNA would we have after the reaction's over? Excellent. Very good. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. And you guys were correct. So one cut is two fragments, three cuts is three fragments. And um, if you can go forward one slide, please, I got that, thank you. And so what you, what's very important is you'll see here is that the sizes of the fragments are not the same. So some will be shorter, some will be longer. And the way we can visualize this is in a process called gel electrophoresis where we separate out these fragments. So we can go on to the next slide. And did you see the question, Wanru, about why um, the DNA is being cut? Yeah. So we uh, cut the DNA for several purposes. Number one, to put other sequences in that we're interested in. Or in this case, we're cutting it into different fragments because we want to differentiate different people's DNA because different people's DNA will be cut up into different sizes. Does that help answer your question? Okay, great. All right, so now we're gonna get into what we do with this cut up DNA, right? We cut it up, it's different. Everyone's DNA is gonna be cut, cut up into different lengths and different sizes. So how, what do we do next? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something called a gel electrophoresis. And you would take a plastic mold like this and it's, we're gonna use a, a powder called agarose, it's very similar to jello. You add your buffer, which is a salt solution. You put it in the microwave, you heat it up, you pour it in here, and then we put our comb in here. So it makes little uh, chambers or what we call wells to which to load your sample, okay? When this is cooled down, you would peel off this tray and we would put it into, let me angle you down so you can see better. Wanru, did we introduce the the issue we're trying to solve? It will, it will be right after this, we will. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then I just want to show them the gel box first. So here's the gel box. Here's our cover. We would put our, there's, of course, there's no gel in here, but we would put our gel in here. Okay. We would slide our gel box cover on. And you'll see here that there's a black and red electrical wire that comes out. We plug it into our supply source and we run an electric current. And what that would do is that, because DNA has a charge to it, it's actually gonna make our DNA migrate down the gel. And in the slide, you can actually see the small pieces will go to the bottom, the largest pieces will be stuck to the top. And that's how we get that nice separation, okay. All right, thank you, Agatha. Then go on to the next slide. All right, so we're actually going to do an RFLP genetic DNA analysis today. Now, it's a very um, simple version of it, but we are going to do it. Okay, so what happened is we have a mystery to solve, which is unfortunately the Launch Lab iPad was broken. It was broken. So someone came toward our lab and broke our iPad. 
and we've been having lots of tours. I know it, it, even during even during uh, COVID, uh, we, we've had an opportunity to have some tours, uh, some safe socially distanced tours, and we were lucky enough to have three guests. Uh, so the music artist Justin Bieber, the uh, wrestling and actor uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and surprisingly Flo, the progressive lady also came. Uh, so we questioned these suspects as to whether they handled our launch labs iPad, where we store all of our chemical inventory. It's a very important uh, equipment that we have here. And they all said that they didn't, but they would be willing to submit a cheek swab sample. So they all swabbed their cheeks with a Q-tip at home. And then we got some DNA off of the iPad. And so now we're gonna try to match the two today. Okay, and then we're gonna find out, we're gonna get to the bottom of this. Okay, so got to, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, you know what? Um, let's go to the next slide. We can come back to this one later while we're waiting. Okay, all right, sounds good. So we actually use a restriction enzyme digest to cut up these three people's DNA samples and we, will, we ran a gel. And now I have a sample from the iPad and we're gonna load all of these samples, the iPad sample, Justin Bieber sample, Dwayne Johnson sample, and Flo the Progressive Lady. We're gonna run the gel, we're gonna compare the band tests. Because again, everybody's DNA will be cut up in a different way. And the way the bands look will look be different as well. If you don't mind going to the next slide. Okay, so I have to get up real close so you can see me here. I'll show you, I'm gonna angle you down. So because we only have a few number of samples, we don't need to use that large gel box that I showed you. I'm gonna use this small, very small gel electrophoresis apparatus. And now they make it so easy, the gel is actually prepackaged already. So I'll show you. I'm going to stop sharing so I can spotlight your video on room. Okay. Oh yes, there you go, that's much better. Okay. So you can see this is a pre-made gel. So inside is um, like that jelly agarose material as I mentioned, I'm gonna peel this well chamber off. Okay. And you can see there's all those indentations, right? So here's my comb. So you can see those are all the wells which will hold my DNA samples. And there's actually electrodes in my um, electrophoresis apparatus. So I'm just gonna pop this in here. Before we start running it, I have to get my samples from the free, from the refrigerator because I DNA, you know, just like all the other reagents in the lab, it's important to keep them in their cool temperature. So I'm gonna go around to grab the sample real quick from the fridge. Why don't you guys make some predictions on who you think did the terrible act of breaking our iPad? What are they saying about that? We have a few options. We have a few votes for Flo, and then it looks like uh, maybe it's Justin Bieber. Um, who's, yeah. Who's in the lead? I think right now it is. It's kind of up. Oh, Flo is in in the lead right now. Oh wow! Okay. And Dwayne. Yeah. Okay, we have a we have a good mix. Okay. So, does anybody know what this thing is here that I'm holding? I'll hold one so you can see. Any guesses? Ooh, dropper and syringe are very, very close. Pipette, yes, very good, Allison. Yes, this is a pipette. And I'm sorry if someone else said it, I just didn't catch it. So pipettes are used to transfer very, very small volumes. Again, in the lab, we oftentimes try to make our volumes as small as possible to save reagents. And um, so this one dispenses two to 20 microliters. So one microliters is one 1,000 of a milliliter and a milliliter is one one thousandth of one liter. So if you think about your Coke, those two liter bottles, that's two liters, okay? So you think about just trying to scale the volume here to give you an idea. And so with pipettes, we always use a pipette tip. So what I did was I actually put that tip on it, you can see. 
so we could pick up the sample and and um, keep our reagents clean so we don't mix our reagents with each other or our samples with each other okay so for this experiment all i need is 10 micrometers and i'm going to take my first sample which i put s so this is our um, ipad sample and i'm going to load it into one of the wells okay so i'm going to pop open this tube here okay and, and what's the reason why sample? great question it's our extracted dna we digested it with the restriction enzyme and so it's cut up it's all cut up in there and then also it's a little bit blue because DNA is clear and the solution is clear. It looks, it will look just like water. So if I pipette this in here, I may not even see it. So the blue is actually a great, uh, we call it an indicator dye. Okay. But the blue color doesn't do anything. It's just like a food coloring. Okay. So I picked up the 10 microliters. As you can see, it's really a small amount, just very there in the tip of the pipette. And then I'm going to load it. I'll try to load it so you can see to the first well. And then I, I, then I dispose of the tip in my, my trash can. Okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold it up. Maybe you can see, can you see the first well? It has a purple thing in it? Sure can. Okay, great. So that's well one. Then I'm gonna skip a well, because we don't wanna contaminate. We don't wanna mix up two samples. I'm gonna skip a well. And then I'm gonna go to sample one, which is Justin Bieber's sample. Thank you, Mr. Bieber, for providing your sample here. Okay, and I will put that into well number three, and I'll show you all one when I'm done. Continuing on like this, getting a new tip. Again, because you don't want to cross contaminate here. Your sample number two, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Okay. And then lastly, sample three. So that jelly, jelly stuff that Juan Ru is loading into is going to just serve like a, a, a loading area. And also since it's jelly-like, it's going to be easy for the DNA to travel when the current is turned on. And we'll see where the DNA splits up so we can see who the culprit is. Exactly, right. And so here I'm gonna get up close. Hopefully you can see every other well has something blue in it. And the remaining wells are empty. Okay. All right. So now let's run it. So I'm going to close the lid and turn it on. So these sort of techniques have been developed over time. So you know, people were studying DNA and you know they were trying to figure out ways to visualize it. And there, in, in a lot of just different um, sciences separation like this is a very typical part of analysis. So in chemistry, it's called chromatography. In biology here, it's called gel electrophoresis. But basically what you're trying to do is you have a medium or, or some sort of material that you're passing your samples through. And just because of the size, you're gonna have the natural separation. So this is a this size separation technique you'll see in many, many different um, applications. All right, so I'm gonna set up the run. I'm putting in the percentage of the gel, which is 1%. And I, we're only going to run it, I think, let's, let's do 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going to do 11 in case, and we're going to start to run. Okay, so you're not going to see much <laughs> this, during this time. We'll only be able to see it when we put it on a special instrument that shines the UV light on it. Okay, but this instrument also has a backlight so I'm going to try to turn it on so you can see oh yes unfortunately it is it is too dark to see but we'll have a, we'll be able to put it in a bigger machine and view it later so it's running and then we'll come back and check on it in 10 minutes we have exactly the right amount of time left so we won't have a lot of time to put, figure it out but wait should we okay. go back to the career slide yeah sounds good Wanru was nice enough to show you ladies some options for how, how the careers work in the life science industry. So go ahead, Wanru. 
Thank see. you so much. I think it's uh, two slides back. Okay, perfect. So I think one of the questions that uh, the lady sent before today's webinar was about uh, the life path for people who want to go into life sciences or sorry, education path for life sciences. So if you have an interest in biology, chemistry, physics, uh, mathematics, you know, any of the science fields, there's so many options for you out there. And the question is, how do I get there? Okay, so first of all, um, a lot of people will enter to get either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. A lot of people now are actually going to community college first and then transferring to a four years college, four year college. But for most scientific industries, a bachelor would be the minimum. And then from there, you can go into many different fields with a bachelor. You can get, or become a research associate or associate scientist, clinical research. Those are people who work more in the hospital setting. You can become a laboratory manager. So I have a bachelor's, I, I'm a laboratory manager. And there are so many other fields, including nursing. You have to get an additional degree for nursing, but you can be a lab tech, environmental technician, um, administrators actually are a very important part of any laboratory or any hospital and business development, um, more on the operations side. A science degree is actually helpful for those industries. Now, if you wanna pursue a more uh, a higher paying and more technical field, you will need to get a second degree, a secondary degree. So that would be either a master's and medical degree MD or PhD. That will take you anywhere from four to six years, depends on the length of, of the program. And for medical doctors, they will also continue on to a residency program where they practice medicine um, in person. And once you have your PhD or doctorate of philosophy or um, medical degree, MD, again, many career paths open to you. You can become a scientist, you can become a medical doctor or researcher. Um, you can, as a doctor or as a scientist, you can actually found your own lab, at which point you would be called a principal investigator or a CEO. You can uh, create your own drug or technology and found your own company. Or you can work for another biotech like a Pfizer, a Moderna, or you know many of the other tenants of Launch Lab, um, of, sorry, of Alexandria, who are doing amazing research um, in the sciences. So lots of opportunities here. It just depends on where your interest lies. Um, any questions about careers or specific? Why don't you, uh, lady, you. share what your kind of goal for a career are right now, even though they may change a million times, why don't you put it in the chat on what you think you want to do now? Yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, lots of options. Let me go into the chat so I can see as well. Pharmacy, biochemistry, forensic scientist. We have somebody who wants to work for the FBI. Biomedical engineering, research in molecular and biology. Mm -hmm. Medical field. Yeah. Hey. The chemistry, it's okay. Some, some people are not into chemistry. Some people love chemistry. Yeah, different fields have different um, emphasis, that's for sure. So if you know it's not your strength, that's totally fine. The crazy thing is, you know, if you like art and you like chemistry, you can actually be a an artist for the chemistry field, right? Where you can create all sorts of visuals and presentations. Yeah. So maybe you know, and you, something that I left out, I think I got to mention it, uh, to me is that uh, if you have interest in computer science, data analysis is like a flow of field that's blowing up because there's very few people who can um, analyze data, work on computer software, and understand the biology or the chemistry as well. So if you have any interest in that. And, um, and as I got to mention, you can combine your interests. So you can be interdisciplinary and combine your interests into a new field. Mm -hmm. 
you'll be a teacher as well. I mean, I, I didn't list it here, but a lot of people who get a PhD, they become a professor and they can continue to conduct their own research. They have their own lab. They apply for grants in areas that they're interested in studying and they hire students and postgrad and postdocs and graduate students to look for them and continue to do research as well. And we had just a few more minutes on our run. In the meanwhile, um, maybe we can go and discuss the PCR technology and then you have to go way to the end for this one. Okay, perfect. Okay, so what, we're, what I'm showing you today, which is digested DNA, which is RFLP, it does have some drawbacks. It's actually an older technology. It was the first DNA typing that was performed. Mm -hmm. You know, so prior to this, the only other typing was blood typing. So they would take a, you know, a, like a sample from the crime scene and they would just try to match the blood type of people. But as you know, there aren't that many blood types. And, you know, a lot of us, like millions of us have the same blood type. So it's really hard to really pinpoint who the, who the criminal was. But using RFLP, which was one of the first techniques, they were actually able to get more specific and match up individuals with samples from the crime scene. But the drawbacks are that you need to have a lot of DNA. You need to have like a tube of blood, or as I mentioned, the, the inside the mouth chick swab. You need a lot of sample from the actual uh, item. So for example, in this iPad example that I'm using, it wouldn't be realistic because there's not much DNA on the iPad actually. It just looks pretty clean. I mean, if you touch it, you're not going to leave a lot of DNA behind. But there is now a newer technology, which is polymerase chain reaction. If we don't have to get too much into the details, but what it does, it's a way to open up the DNA and amplify specific sequences of the DNA. And what it does is it multiplies it exponentially, with like double and then quadruple and then eighth of that. So if we go to the next slide, We'll show you a closer up example of how the amplification occurs. So one of the properties of DNA is when you heat it up, the two sides of the helix will actually open up and it allows you access to those base pairs. So what we can do is we can anneal something or stick something called a DNA primer. I'm so sorry, gotcha. Can we go to the next slide? There it goes. Okay, so on the very left hand side, there's your double stranded DNA. We heat it to 95 degrees. We're going to put those magenta things, which are primers, so they're specific sequences. Then we add enzymes to fill in the rest of the DNA, so DNA ligase, and then it, it just fills it in. And then before, where you had only one strand, now you have two double strands. And if you keep doing this, if you keep heating it, cooling it, heating it, cooling it, you will get millions and millions of copies of DNA. And then what you do is you would run a gel electrophoresis. And as you can see in that example there, you can see that they have a crime scene PCR sample and three suspects. And the PCR is very specific to the sequence, just like the restriction endonucleus. It only sticks where that sequence is located. You get the variations. And this is a great technique because it allows you to use a small amount of DNA, multiply it, millions and millions of times to the point where you can actually get these identifying patterns. And with that, the timing's perfect because our gel is done. So it's only got 44 seconds left, but I think it's ready to be removed. And in the meanwhile, I'm gonna turn on the instrument. Okay. I'm gonna open this up, our gel box. And I have a little spatula here, which is gonna help me pop it out of here. And I know you guys can't see this, but trust me, when I touch it, it is warm. It is warm in here. Because again, that electricity has been running through the top electrode into the bottom. And you'll be able to see that there's different colors. Do you guys see that? Okay, so this is not the DNA. We can, actually can't see the DNA, it's actually, um, we need a UV light to see it, but that's where that dye helps a lot. So remember each sample, as you can see, each sample has that purple dye. It's called an indicator dye. 
So it shows you how far the DNA has run. As a matter of fact, if I kept running this, this would run out to the bottom and we'd lose our sample. So it's great that we have this. All right, so now we're ready to visualize our DNA and I'm going to turn the camera around. And this is our gel imager. Inside is a tray, which we're gonna open up. Give it a second. Okay. And there's a piece of glass and the light will shine up from the bottom. We're just gonna put our gel right on top like this. And I, I might have to pick this iPad up. Give me one second because it's going to. It takes them. It takes a minute here. It's the camera is actually okay. So, okay. So let me show you. I mean, let's do that so you can see. There you go. It's a little better, right? Okay. So this is with the regular white light, like a fluorescent light, like you might have at home. And as you can see, we see nothing. We see the gel, and then we see where those purple bands were. So now we're going to go to a setting called nucleic acid gel. So that's DNA gel. And that's when it's going to run, oh, it's going to turn on that UV lamp. And it's good. It's all it's doing when it's saying initialization is it's turning on the camera, checking to see how bright it looks. Okay, there it is, there it is. I'm actually gonna make it a little bit brighter because it's a little bit dark. So I'm gonna increase the exposure. All right, maybe maybe even a little brighter than that so you guys can see really well. Okay, there you go. Is that bright enough to see? Yep. <laughs> so if you guys remember, the sample on the left marked M is the iPad sample. Number two <laughs> is Justin Bieber. Number three is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And number four is Flo. So I can't believe it, but it's, Flo, <laughs> she's a Geico. Flo. So for the all of us, it's called Flo. I still think Flo is great. All right, so we are done. And then by the way, the great thing about this is we can save all of our gel images here. So, if we were, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna email this, this photo to Flo to show her that it was actually her. It's okay. She has insurance, so I think she'll be able to cover the cost of the iPad. <laughs> How could All she right. do this? <laughs> you guys called it. It was it's so funny. I, I she's like the most innocent looking one too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ladies, you are right on. You are right. On. Matt, you have answered every question correctly. You even guessed, <laughs> guessed who who she was. She, she was she's suspicious. Yes, she was. That smile. What's she hiding? Right. Okay, any other questions from anything that you've seen today or any comments or anything? And check your calendar invites for um, Juan Ru's uh, LinkedIn and you can link in with Juan Ru um, to stay connected. And uh, what, before before we head out, please just put in the chat what you, what you enjoyed most and then um, we will see you at our next event. And I hope you enjoyed today, ladies. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Wanru, great job. Oh, so great meeting all of you. This is really fun. And you guys made it really fun too with your questions.